Welcome, everyone. So, I, this is our third live reading, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's every bit as edgy and exciting every time. Welcome to the heart of the library, where we celebrate local authors, the spoken word, freedom to access, and the beauty of listening and in absorbing good literature together. So I am going to introduce um, Helen Giroux, who will in turn um, introduce our beloved author. Have a good time. How can you help it? Um, most of you here know Annick well, but maybe we'll have some new online guests that won't be as familiar with her life um, as we are. She loves the Four Seasons, and her bedtime stories reflect some of those, uh, some of her impressions of living in our uh, beautiful Gatineau Hills. Um, others emerge from her childhood in France, where she studied uh, English at Université de Lille, and uh, later uh, from Scotland, where she met her husband John, and she also taught French. Um, and then they had postings to Malawi, Antigua, and Canada, where they came here and where they raised their uh, their three children. And this is Anik's three. three. What did I say? Two. Two. Sorry. Three. <laughs> <laughs> this is Anik's third book. Uh, the others are back to Maxwell and Second Chance, a second chance. In speaking with Anik about her book, I found that her story about how what inspired her to write the book as compelling as her stories themselves. And she is going to share with you the inspiration for bedtime stories, as well as why she wrote it in English and in French. And she'll also share the inspiration for her quirky title. Um, I also asked Annick what were her passions um, beyond uh, writing. And her reply was, um, I found was a little creative work of art in itself. And she said, above all gardening, seeding, dividing, the life force, a miracle. I need a studio crammed to the roof with quilting material, wool, glue, paints, papers. Then I can relax. You never know when the grandchildren want to create something. You have to be ready. I like a creative mess. I hate housework. I love the seasons, the water, the snow. And with this portrait of uh, Anik, I'd like to invite her to share with you what inspired her to wear, to write bedtime stories for tired grown-ups and to read her um, chosen uh, excerpts. And once she's done that, we'll uh, invite you to uh, ask, her ask her questions of her writing and to share your thoughts about her, um, about her writing and her reading. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. And a special thank you to Hélène, because she's just worked very hard at the writer's Fet, and then immediately I phoned her and I said, can you do something else? And she said yes. So thank you so much, Elaine, for, for being here. So um, in 2019, I was introduced to the work of a Scottish writer, James Robertson. I love his historical, historical novels, The Fanatic and Joseph Knight. And he'd also written a book called 365 Stories. 365 stories of 365 words. I typed them, so I know that's what he did. I typed one. And in 365 days. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. What could be easier? So I wrote to him, and he warned me, it's a tough gig, I can tell you. By day nine, I knew what he meant. 356 days to go, and I knew I wasn't going to make it. So I wrote back to him. I said, I can't do it. And he answered, keep on writing. Years ago, I learned that in the writing life, nothing is ever wasted. So then I thought, maybe I could manage to write one story a week. <laughs> Uh, so that would be 52 stories for a year of 520 words to copy him. He said, go ahead. <laughs> so then I also decided that the book would be bilingual, and that took the best of another year, because I, I, I rewrote them in French. Um, and uh, so here it is. So this is this beautiful book 
Uh, the cover is beautiful. I hope that the content does it justice. So it's like in the government, you know, uh, French on the uh, English on the other side, Francie or So, so uh, why I did that is because I am raising money for La Maison des Collines, and the past two books were in English, and uh, both communities, francophone, anglophone, are big supporters of La Maison des Collines. So then I thought, ah, I'm going to write it in, in French as well. So that's what I did. I also met uh, a nice uh, uh, Jean-Luc Lécuyer. Maybe you buy his sausages. And he's a wonderful guy, and he's a neighbor of mine. And one day I met him at the La Salle store, and he gave me hell for not writing in French. So I said, OK, I will do it for you. So that's what I did. Um, so the title, uh, Bedtime Story for Child Grown-Ups, is because I meet people, and obviously not you, because you're in the library, so you read. But a lot of people say they don't have time. They would like it, but they don't have time. So I said, all right, so can you manage 520 words in a week? And they said, maybe. So that's as much as it takes to write 520 words. So that's why I made it like that. So that's the title. And, um, and that's about it. So um, Alison, who is here, made this beautiful cover. I'm so thrilled with it. <laughs> she drove the Prince of Nuts because he had to do what's called a tumble version. And first he did the back the wrong way and all this. And we sort she sorted it out. And uh, she was also my editor. And then I had a French editor that was Pierre Lebel, and he helped me because a few texts have a little bit of Quebecois in it, and that's not my uh, my strong point. So uh, he helped me with that. So that was great. So anyway, I so, decided now I was just going to start reading the first story, since it's the first one in the book, and the, and then at the end I will read the last story and a couple in between. And one of them will be in French. Well, Michael and Denis, who are here today. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so I am going to read you the first story. And it is called Crossword. Paddy's pub is busy tonight. Outside, gusts of wind slap a fine film of snow against a wooden sign. She hurries in, removes her fogged up glasses, and shakes her wet hair. Her husband is waving at her. He's not sitting at their regular table, the corner one, right underneath the light, which they need to do their weekly crossword puzzle. It's Barney who is sitting at their table. He's perched on the edge of the chair, an ancient canvas backpack between his legs. Occasionally, he glances out through the dirty window pane, where his dog, a little ball of black and white fur curled up against the outside wall to protect himself from the wind, is waiting for him. He's keeping, and he keeps turning a baleful eye towards his master before pretending to go back to sleep. Nobody knows where Barney comes from. He appeared one day with his dog and started lending a hand at the pub from time to time, picking up garbage near the recycling bins, shoveling the pass in front of the door, never asking for anything in return. But the cook usually had a little something for him. He would hand over a couple of parcels, and Barney, a man of few words, would nod and mumble a thank you before wandering off with his dog. Where he slept, nobody knew for sure. At first, he had been seen coming out of an abandoned barn on the hill, the Ferguson's barn, as people around here knew it. They started calling him Barney. But a team of workers came one day and dismantled the barn to make room for townhouses. Still, the nickname stuck. Rumor has it that he now sleeps in a cabin in the woods, but people have yet to find where. The waiter brings their drinks to the table. She raises a glass, the foamy cream of the Guinness touching her lips. Are we done? No, one more clue. Eight down. European bison, six letters, says her husband, pointing to the paper. She shakes her head. No idea. I didn't even know there were bison in Europe. Barney's food bag is ready. 
He picks up his backpack, and as he passes by the table, he mutters something. Excuse me? She says, wiping her mouth. Why isn't, he repeats, before letting himself out. Outside the window, the dog stands up and wags his tail furiously against his master's leg, and the two of them cross the street. What did he say? She asked her husband. Don't know. The, man's, the poor man's brain are fried. I wonder where he's off to in this weather. He shrugs. I don't know. God knows. While he gets up to order a refill from the barman, she scans the back of the, the page of the paper for the answer to the crossword clues. Eight down, Vizant. She stares out at the street. Barney is long gone. <laughs> I have been told by a close member of my family that I have an anecdotal mind. <laughs> I'm not sure what he meant by that, but anyway, uh, there must be some truth in it. Because um, in that anecdotal brain of mine, I have stored many bits of conversation and quirky events that I witness or hear about. So for this second story, I use three little incidents the first one happened to my son, the second one to my husband, and the third one is courtesy of a very loud English woman in a hotel dining room in Scotland. <laughs> but for the sake of the story, they all happened to a certain Andrew. So the story is called Faulty Connections. Andrew Stevenson is not a recluse. He does like his own company, but he's not antisocial. However, he no longer makes much of an effort to socialize, especially with women. It all started years ago when he was a Boy Scout. He already had an impressive collection of merit badges, winter camping, team spirit, canoeing, astronomy, first aid, and others. But there were many more to get. One time, he was standing at a traffic light, waiting for it to change so he could cross the street, when a frail old lady holding a white cane came to stand beside him. The pedestrian light lit up, and he could hear the beeping signal that said it was safe to, to cross the street. But the old lady was not moving. Maybe he could take her on and help her. Would that count for his citizenship in the community badge? <laughs> Safe to cross now, he said as he touched her lightly on the elbow. No shit, Sherlock. I may be blind, but I'm not deaf, <laughs> she answered and pushed him aside so brusquely that he almost lost his balance. <laughs> Later in his student days, he was the best man at a friend's wedding near Guelph. He offered to pick up ice for the drinks and was stacking the frozen plastic bags in the trunk of his car at a nearby gas station. A very attractive young woman was glaring at the pump. I hate self-serves, she said. He walked over and started the pump for her. Thanks, you're ever so kind. Big smile on her face. Oh, another thing. I'm looking for the Riley Farm, the one that advertises fresh corn. Can't help you there. I'm from Quebec, he said. She glanced at his license plate. The smile is gone. At least you can speak English. That's a start. <laughs> <laughs> After years of living in Canada, he goes back home for, to Scotland for a holiday. He wants to see the old family farm. In other hands now, but still a growing concern. Everything that matters in life, he has learned it there. Hard work patience, respect for nature, resilience, and simplicity. At the B&B &B where he's staying, there's another guest, a reader like him, a good-looking woman, more or less his age, maybe late 50s, widowed, divorced. She always acknowledges him when she comes down to breakfast, accompanied by a young child, a grandson, probably. Tonight, she seems to be alone. She's settled in the armchair by the, pit, by the pit fireplace, looks up from her book, and smiles at Andrew when he enters the room. 
He's trying to gather up courage to talk to her. Maybe he could start by asking her about the book she's reading. But the boy budges in, his cheeks red for being outdoors. Granny, I'm going to be a farmer one day. Oh no, darling, you are much too smart for that. She turns towards Andrew and flashes an amused smile at him, but he has buried his nose in the newspaper. <laughs> Well, name. I often revisited my youth in France. Sometimes there some autobiographical uh, text came out of it. Sometimes it was just like a little kernel to start a, a different story, so uh, a fictionalized story. So um, I also traveled the globe in my head, revisiting places I had lived in. So one day, I was looking at my cookbooks it's a bit of a joke because I cannot follow a recipe. <laughs> I always put notes, I follow the recipe for God's sake, once. I write that in my cookbook. The girls want the cookbooks. Uh, anyway, I just look at this and at least five stories came out of that exercise and they were none about food, but it had sort of triggered things in my head. So I came across a moussaka recipe written by a neighbor of ours, uh, a Greek Canadian, who was a neighbor of ours. He used to spend the winters in Antigua where we lived. So that generated another two stories. One is completely fictional about a Greek ship coming to Halifax. Uh, the other one is more a reflection on the quirkiness of the British. I won't read that one. You can read it. <laughs> Other times, I would go and visit Rose. Now, Rose lives in my brain, in the room, the one beside the anecdotal one. Uh, she has a husband. He's called Mike Walters. Uh, Rose is a child at heart and a fantastic daydreamer. She comes out from time to time, and I am going to read you a story where she is at the airport. This is called Rose at the Airport. AC865, 750, sorry, 1750. Rose had better get it right. Not like last time when she was caught in a traffic jam and Mike had waited forever. Rush hour, leave in plenty of time and please, Remember where you parked the car, he'd said before he left. The parking fiasco had happened last year, but he's not about to let her forget. She can still see the two of them wandering up and down the rows. When they found the car eventually, it was on a different level. He was fit to be tied. Rose loves the hustle and bustle of airports. She loses herself in the drama of other lives. The tearful partings, the emotional reunions, kids waving at their grandparents with bouquets and balloons, crowds of days and exhausted passengers trickling out of the automatic doors, searching for a familiar face. Mike is a seasoned traveler, always one of the first to come out behind the dashing pilots and the air attendants who rush past the line of cardboard lines, car, sorry, cardboard signs with passenger names on them. She often thinks it would be nice to be welcomed into the country that way. She would like to see a stranger holding one of those for her, Rose Walters. That's what she's going to do for Mike today. She has printed his name on a rigid card, Michael Walters in big, bold letters. She's going to look so professional, he won't recognize her. New blazer, well, new to him, as she found it at the secondhand store. White blouse, black pants, the elegant pumps she never wears, and most importantly, a wig. <laughs> the Elvis one from the Halloween box. <laughs> Worn the wrong side, the wrong side, the wrong way round, it looks quite smart. As for the makeup, that takes a bit of getting used to. 
She practiced in front of the mirror last night, but she didn't like the greasy film from the lipstick, and the mascara made her eyelids heavy. So today she has changed into the business suit at home, but has left the makeup and wig for the last minute. In the airport car park, she scribbles down, 32 row D, level two, yellow, on a piece of paper before heading for the arrival zone. In the washroom, she starts applying the mascara and the lipstick. Above the mirror, a large poster ask people to report any suspicious behavior <laughs> to the authorities. She can't see a camera, but just in case, she goes inside one of the cubicles to put the, the wig on. <laughs> At the arrival gate, she joins a group of people holding similar signs. Mike is one of the first to appear through the doors. He scans the crowd, passes twice in front of her, ignoring the sign that she waves at him. <laughs> Mike, here! Rose, what the? <laughs> you are, Mike shakes his head, but he frowns, his frown has turned into a smile. You are nuts, and take that stupid wig off. <laughs> Still, as long as you remember where you parked the car. Yes, I wrote it on down. The paper is on the dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> surtout pour mon ami, mes amis Denis et Marie-Claude qui sont ici. So, um, okay, this story uh, is in French, and it's a, it's a Christmas tale. So, uh, I'm going to read it in French. And it's about Eugène, who is a beekeeper. So, Eugène, l'apiculteur. Marie se promène au marché de Noël à Ottawa. Une masse couche de givre couvre les toiles des tentes des vendeurs. Les voix chevrotantes d'une chorale de l'armée du salut essaient de rivaliser avec les haut-parleurs qui diffusent les rengaines traditionnelles du temps des fêtes. Marie continue de marcher tout en adressant un sourire coupable aux chanteurs. Elle aurait dû leur donner quelques sous. Elle sort sa liste de sa poche. Ah oui, le miel de sarrasin pour Georges. Elle scrute l'allée de droite à gauche à la recherche de la tante d'Eugène. Eugène est un vieux grognon, mais personne n'a de meilleur miel que lui. Elle pense parfois que toute la douceur dont il est capable, il la met dans ses pots de miel. Il y a d'autres bons apiculteurs, mais Eugène est un voisin et elle trouve qu'elle devrait s'approvisionner chez lui. Et pourtant, il ne lui rend jamais son salut quand elle le croise. Il a même levé le poing une fois quand elle roulait à trop vive allure et avait causé un grand nuage de poussière sur le chemin. Elle s'est excusée le lendemain matin quand elle est allée chercher le courrier avec son chien. Mais le vieil homme lui a tourné le dos en bougonnant quelques insultes sur les gros chars des riches. « Il y en a du monde, les affaires marchent bien, lui dit-elle gaiement. »« Ces fonctionnaires du gouvernement » Payé à rien faire avec l'argent de mes impôts, ça me rend malade, répond Eugène, tout en empochant les billets verts de deux clients qui s'éloignent les bras chargés d'achat. Elle achète son miel et six chandelles en cire d'abeille. Il fait un froid glacial. Elle rejoint d'autres visiteurs qui se réchauffent en tapant du pied autour d'un brasero allumé. Tout le monde est joyeux en ce temps des fêtes. Tous sauf un, un homme solitaire qui se tient à l'écart, profitant à peine du cercle de chaleur, comme s'il savait qu'il n'y avait pas droit. Son vieux parka, taché de graisse, laisse passer la ouate de la bourre à l'épaule gauche. Est-ce qu'elle devrait lui offrir un chocolat chaud Le regarder dans les yeux au moins Mais lui, il a le regard fixé sur la tente de Gênes. Elle le voit s'approcher de la table avec toutes les décorations en cire d'abeille. Il montre du doigt un petit ange. « C'est combien ?»« Cinq piastres, » dit Eugène, levant à peine les yeux du livre qu'il est en train de lire. L'homme secoue la tête en s'éloignant d'un pas traînant. Hey, « Hé, toi, viens ici !» L'homme se retourne. 
« J'ai rien touché, » dit-il d'un air anxieux. Eugène emballe l'ange dans un papier de soie. « Tiens, je te le donne. » It's called the park bench. Extensive work has been necessary to control yearly, yearly flooding of the, in the heart of the village. Once the deep culvert is in place to direct the spring melt underneath the road and into the Gatineau River, the big machines leave. A team of volunteers start landscaping the narrow piece of wasteland edged by the stream. They turn it into a little park planting saplings that one day will give shade, and designing flower beds that will soon be covered by a carpet of perennials. Their little park is very new, but full of promises. They dedicate it to Louis, a craftsman of song, music, and candles. He loved the village, he loved the river, and he loved people. It didn't matter where you met him, Louis always had time for you and made you feel you were just the person he wanted to talk to. We all knew him and we all loved him. At the entrance to the park, there are two benches near the plaque that honors him. The seats may be new, but the pale gray wood is a reminder of the local farms in the valley. They invite you to come and sit for a while. During the long winter of 2021, because of the pandemic, two old men can no longer have a meal or a cup of coffee in one of the local restaurants. They now meet in the park. They dress warmly, order takeout from the neighboring cafe, clear the snow off one of the benches, and start talking. They come from different backgrounds. One lived in New York and was brought up in a Jewish family. The other is of Irish descent. His childhood split between downtown Ottawa and a rustic cottage up the line. They've had different careers, but the village knows them as wordsmiths. One is a poet, the other one is a writer. What do they talk about on this clear and sunny Thursday? The people they love and have loved? This crazy world they're living in? Their pets, politics, their childhood, philosophy, their dreams, they are not at a loss for words. Between the two of them, they have collected nearly 200 years of stories, ready to be retold, embellished, reworked in another novel or a new poem. Gifts for their friends, their old students, the village. Louis is there too. They cannot see him, but he's listening to them. Maybe he's even getting inspiration for the lyrics to his next song. Oh. Oh.